Good evening from Washington. I'm Larry O'Connor. And as you know, national security and foreign affairs are very important to us over here. They don't get a whole lot of headlines. People talk about it, you know, when there's bombs going off or when there's tanks rolling through a foreign country. But uh, we should be talking about it on a daily basis to make sure that the United States military stays ready for whatever might come our way. If there's anything we've learned over the last 20 years, you can't predict what might come our way. And we're going to discuss many of those things with our next guest. He knows what he's talking about. He's Robert Wilkie. He was the former Secretary of Veterans Affairs and also the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. Uh, Secretary Wilkie, thank you for joining us today. It's good to see you again, Larry. Well, a major problem in our country right now, according to the Pentagon, it's not my observation, it's just a fact that we have a very uh, huge recruitment problem right now. We are missing the mark across every branch of the military. What, what do you make of that? What do you think is the cause? Well, I think a couple of things. I do think it accelerated after the, the disaster in Afghanistan. Uh, I certainly saw that in places in, around the country where, you know, military service is, is automatic in the thinking of most people. And that's in that part of our country that runs uh, from Virginia to Texas. I also think that in those areas that are most fruitful for military recruitment, I'll give you an example. I mean, 60 percent of the officers in the four services come from 11 states, hmm. uh, from Virginia to Texas. Um, I think people have seen, in spite of what the Secretary of the Army said last week, that uh, the military is being now divided into racial, ethnic, and sexual categories. And, and people are being forced to do things that uh, the military has never forced them to do. And we're seeing that play out in all aspects. And one, one last thing, uh, the same Secretary of the Army who said that uh, only the right wing uh, talks about woke, wokeness in the military. This is the same Secretary of the Army who went down to Fort Bragg, and instead of talking about the readiness of the All-American Division or Special Operations Command, said that uh, Fort Bragg is leading the world in fighting climate change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in that, she joined her other two service secretaries who say that their number one priority is climate change. So it is not focusing on America and America's enemy. Well, Secretary Wilkie, you seem to have a good handle on how I go about my business because you walked right into my next line of questioning. That has to do with Secretary of the Army Christine Wormuth. I want to quote her verbatim. She said, uh, there is a drip, drip, drip of criticism about a woke military and it's having some counterproductive efforts on recruiting. In other words, she doesn't think it's the, the woke nature of what's coming out of the Pentagon and the fact that the military is being told that climate change is their number one enemy and that they need to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion and transgender policies and who's sleeping in what barracks and bathrooms and all that. No, no, no. It's Republican lawmakers criticizing or calling into question whether those policies are hurting readiness. It's the Republican lawmakers who are making the difference. That's a blatantly political argument, and there's no basis for it. Well, there is no basis for it. And all she has to do is, is repeat the words of uh, the chief of staff, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who, you know, in that infamous uh, appearance before the House Armed Services Committee, uh, read off of Black Lives Matter talking points. She can look at the United States Military Academy, where now you can substitute courses on uh, military history, American military history, world military history, for courses on sex and civilization uh, and, and ethnic diversity. Um, you could say the same thing about the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy. Um, and I, I, don't think it, I don't think it was Republican. I don't think it was Republican senators or congressmen who compelled the Air Force to have a drag queen performance on a base in Nevada. It only got canceled because Republican lawmakers draw attention to it. That's that's right. Can you imagine if I, as the Under Secretary of Defense under General Mattis, had said, "Yeah, it's all right to have strip shows on naval bases." Right. Yeah. Um, well, Elizabeth you would have been very Warren popular been with the troops, right. Secretary. Right. Yeah. Elizabeth Warren would have been coming out of the wall. Probably. Um, Probably. And camped up in a, camped in a tent um, <laughs> on the Pentagon lawn. Um, so we, we now have, Larry, a secretary of the Air Force who says that race is now going to be considered in promotion and assignments. We just had a pride event where a three-star Air Force general said that her decisions on promotion and assignment uh, have to do with whether or not she believes in the efficacy of the state laws yeah. at which her troops or airmen will be stationed. In fact, hold that thought, Secretary Wilkie, because again, you, you're anticipating where I'm going. We've got the video. This is a general 
For the Space Force, I believe, let's take a look. Transformational cultural change requires leadership from the top. And we do not have time to wait. Since January of this year, more than 400 anti-LGBTQ plus laws have been introduced at the state level. That number is rising and demonstrates a trend that could be dangerous for service members, their families, and the readiness of the force as a whole. When I look at potential candidates, say for squadron command, I strive to match the right person to the right job. I consider their job performance and relevant experience first. However, I also look at their personal circumstances and their family is also an important factor. It's a good match for a job does not feel safe being themselves and performing at their highest potential at a given location, or if their family could be denied critical health care due to the laws in that state. I am compelled to consider a different candidate and perhaps less qualified. That's Lieutenant General Deanna Burt. She's the Deputy Chief of Space Operations for Cyber and Nuclear United States Space Force. Uh, first of all, that's her admitting that she discriminates based on job placement depending on the state and the sexual situation in uh, officers' home. But secondly, I'm old enough to remember that an officer in uniform is not supposed to dabble into obvious partisan political discussions like that. I, I mean, I, would that have gone over in, as you mentioned, Secretary Mattis's Pentagon? General Mattis would have dismissed that individual. And I, and I think, Larry, we have gone a long way from the great George C. Marshall and his biographies are sitting behind me here, who said, I serve only the Republic, to General Milley making the statements that he's making, and now uh, this general, uh, openly criticizing the laws of the individual states and promoting a political agenda. Um, the, the tradition of the United States, unlike Europe, uh, unlike South America, has been that the military is apolitical. It does not discuss these things. And, and now we see uh, this infecting uh, every level of the force, from pronoun indoctrination uh, to, um, as I said earlier, the Secretary of the Air Force saying that race is now to be considered. And then when, when you hear your, 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 your familiar, familiarity with the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. uh, the former superintendent, uh, actually, saying that the United States is not a worthy nation, um, that we, we need to um, swear to um, fight against ableism, whatever that means, sexism, racism, um, et cetera, et cetera. And ne these naval cadets of midshipmen are now taking oaths along those lines. And the sad thing is that these people do not understand the beauty of the military. Uh, I've spent my life in it. I was born in khaki diapers. The military is the great leveler in society. If you perform, you are accepted. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from, what you look like. And the other side is that the United States Armed Forces, and you know this from personal experience, looks more like America than any other industry, any other force, uh, any other business in this country. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to me, it is, um, it is an incredibly sad day, and it is... Uh, dangerous for this nation. Well said, sir. Uh, Robert Wilkie is the former Secretary of Veterans Affairs. And in a moment, we're going to continue our conversation. What is the state of affairs for our veterans in this country under President Biden? And also all this readiness, it's a problem if we actually have a conflict. And there's a lot of conflicts in this world. We'll get to it next on O'Connor Tonight. We continue our conversation with Robert Wilkie, the former Secretary of Veterans Affairs and also former Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness under President Trump. Secretary Wilkie, I've had many conversations with you in the past, uh, your deep concern for our veterans and uh, how they can uh, get the care that they deserve, that they're owed, uh, especially in uh, these extraordinary times after the global war on terror and the very unique aspects of what those veterans had to deal with overseas and have to deal with back home. Uh, that's why I was struck by this tweet from uh, Congressman Corey Mills of Florida. He's a veteran as well. He pointed out that June is post-traumatic stress disorder awareness month. But all you see from the military is, well, is this stuff. It's all about pride. It's all about, uh, you know, inclusion. It's all about the the priority of diversity and equity specifically focused on sexual orientation and sexual identity. I hate to keep be beating this drum, but uh, where's the messaging? Where's the concern? Where's the focus on PTSD? Because they give lip service to our vets, 
right. but they don't actually spend well, a lot of time focusing well, on it. I'll just give you an example, Larry, of what happened at Veterans Affairs. Uh, the last time you and I talked when I was in office, I was at the end of three years of fighting the Pelosi House from ripping down Abraham Lincoln's words from our VA hospitals and our VA headquarters, the famous passage that begins with malice toward none from the second mm. inaugural. Yes. Because Pelosi and her friends decided that, you know, honest Abe, had the temerity not to mention 21st century pressure groups in a speech that he gave in March of 1865. Um, well, the first thing that this secretary did was begin the process to rip those words down, uh, which he did. Um, and, and that's been the priority. It's been on uh, progressive theatrics. Uh, you just showed uh, a snapshot of the face page of the unit my father commanded in the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, which is America's primary res primary strategic strike force in terms of conventional operations. Um, you know, now those commanders cannot even allow a higher standard of physical fitness to be imposed on their division yeah. because this secretary of the army says it's not going to be equitable. And, and unlike other conventional military forces, the 82nd Airborne, those soldiers carry everything they fight with on their backs over a hundred pounds, but yet the commanders under the Biden Pentagon cannot say we need higher physical standards. Right. Um, and in my father's day, he was allowed to impose those, but you can't now. And uh, now one last thing, uh, and this gets to really the, the heart of defending the country. No longer will senior enlisted and officers have physical fitness failures put on their efficiency report. Hmm. That's sort of an all shucks uh, to the to the troops uh, that, you know, we really don't take this stuff seriously. Well, and of, and and of course, and the irony here, Secretary Wilkin, I think the irony is lost on these leaders, most of them civilian, but certainly there are military leaders who are influenced by the politics of those civilian leaders, that if Russia or North Korea or Iran or China have their way because we're not ready and focused on defeating our enemy, not only will the plight of the climate be a lot worse off, <laughs> but also the plight of, of gay people around the world. You, you want That's Iran true. to win that discussion? You want China to win that discussion or Vladimir Putin? If you really do care about diversity and inclusion, you'll make sure that our military is as strong as possible to defeat the enemies of freedom and liberty. Yeah, and, and look, I, I, I've said this and, and people thought I was joking, but I'm not. Uh, with these changes in policy, the changes in emphasis, uh, we see a, a leadership that's bound and determined to give the enemy a fair fight. <laughs> and, and equity will get people killed. Um, if, you, if you don't, I would rather have two troops in shape at the top of their game than have to carry eight more who don't meet basic physical fitness standards. Mm -hmm. And last thing, Larry, um, when you continually call this nation irredeemably racist or unjust, why would you want people to defend it? Those are words from Joe Biden. And you, 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 you know, you're, you've been talking about China for years. When the Secretary of State went to our state of Alaska and was harangued mm -hmm. by the Chinese foreign minister, saying that America was racist, that he was just quoting Joe Biden's speeches. The only thing that the Secretary of State could do was mouth a bunch of academic pieties about how we have to do better. Right. When that had been Richard Nixon or Larry O'Connor, <laughs> the response would be the United States would not be lectured by a country that has murdered 100 million of its own people yeah. since 1949. Secretary Wilkie, you keep talking about your father and, and this whole uh, tradition in America of, of uh, sons and daughters following in their father's and mother's yeah. footsteps and joining the military. It's still there. I, as you keep alluding to, I just got to enjoy my daughter's graduation and commissioning from the Naval Academy. And it was great to see generations of families in uniform celebrating uh, their 22-year-old just getting their commission. But it's waning. Uh, I hear from it all the time on my radio program. I've got vets who call me and tell me I would not recommend my son join the military now. Uh, are they taking this seriously at the Pentagon? Do they know that this is a problem? Or is this kind of the plan? They, they, you mentioned those states from Virginia to Texas. Well, they don't like the people in those states. Are they trying to remake the military in their own image? Well, I think they are. 
Uh, I think they are. I think the military was really the last bastion of of traditional patriotism, a traditional concept of America and what it means to defend it. And um, part of this leftist push has been to destroy everything that makes America unique. I mentioned I spent three years fighting their attempts to remove Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, in his words from from V. I mean, just think about that. And I hate to quote the great philosopher Bill Maher, <laughs> but he said something a, a few months ago that struck me. He said, for liberals, it used to be that Abraham Lincoln was good and that racial blindness was better. Um, and now this has been turned on its head. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I worry because when this last happened, when the military imploded in on itself when I was in high school after Vietnam, at least Jimmy Carter didn't despise the nation that he led. Hmm. And he made sure that people who thought the way he did were put in positions of power. Yeah. And I think that's the great difference between now and then. And um, it, is, it is sending a signal, particularly to people who traditionally think about the military, that they're not welcome. Secretary Wilkie, before I let you go, uh, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom looks like he's running for something. Uh, whether Joe Biden steps aside or not, uh, either this time or next time, he's going. And he's been confronted on the sorry state of affairs in his state, specifically with regard to the homeless situation. And I know as Secretary of the Veterans Affairs, you were very much honed in on that and focused on that. Uh, it, 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 it's an absolute uh, embarrassment and shame for our nation that so many of the people who are homeless are veterans. How is that progress? This should be something that transcends party lines. Well, you, you and I actually talked about efforts for VA in your own hometown. Um, the area of Los Angeles outside of VA, the central part of the city, yeah. um, was disgraceful. You've got the pictures up now. Um, we were actually sending teams out to grab veterans and even put, and put them behind the fence at VA. The majority of those in the VA community who are homeless, actually, really, the majority are still Vietnam veterans, mm. and they were never welcomed home. Uh, I certainly saw that in my father's own career. Um, but the, the problem in places like Los Angeles is that it's such a permissive climate um, that VA is left picking up the pieces. Because by the time we reach those veterans, they have been put in a place where drug use is, is, is not looked askance on, um, where there's no law and order, um, and, and things tend to spiral down. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's a problem of governance, and the military is just really on the, the tail end of what people like Gavin Newsom and Gascon and several of the others have been doing to it. Well, there's certainly the mayor of Portland and the mayor of Seattle, what is, they've done to our cities. It sounds like no matter how aggressive and effective the policies from Veteran Affairs might be to focus on homeless vets, if you don't have local and state laws that continue to enforce those common sense basics of Western civilization, it's just always going to be an uphill fight. Secretary Wilkie, and, we got to leave it there, sadly. We are up against it. You know how the clock is. It's rough. But thank you for joining us. Don't be a stranger. We want to have you back. Good stuff. There's more to come on O'Connor tonight. A lot of people in this country are frustrated with the actions of the Justice Department, the FBI, and the special counsel who has now indicted President Trump just a week ago on 37 different criminal charges. They're frustrated and they want to do something about it. 55% of the American people believe these indictments were politically motivated. That is degrading to our system of justice and the American people's confidence in our institutions. That's a problem. So now what do we do about it? Well, our next guest, Jenny Beth Martin, is the founder and national coordinator, coordinator for Tea Party Patriots, and she knows a little something about letting your voice be heard up against the big federal government. Jenny Beth, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. Well, I saw your town hall column that said it's time to hold Merrick Garland accountable, but uh, who's going to hold him accountable? I mean, honestly, you know how hopeless people feel right now. It's like there's, no, there's literally nothing we can do about this, the way the system is rigged. 
Well, I, I completely understand how people feel. And remember, my group, Tea Party Patriots, was targeted by the IRS and we were targeted for years and the effects of that were chilling among our supporters and we never saw true justice with that. So I do understand the frustration very, very well. I think that Merrick Garland should be impeached and the House of Representatives should proceed with such an impeachment, even if the Senate doesn't want to, to take that up. What is happening right now is a complete and total abuse of power. And if we don't work to stop it and to stand up against it right now as it is happening, and we don't urge elected officials to do what they can to help stand up against it, we're going to see even more degre degradation of the foundations of our government. Yeah. We have to have trust between the people and the government, and it does not exist right now. I've talked to members of Congress. I know you do on a regular basis too, Jenny Beth Martin, and a lot of them, though, they may like that idea, and they say, you bet we should utilize the impeachment process that's in the Constitution for just such an occasion. They're concerned. They're concerned about the politics. They're st they still worry after all these years, Jenny Beth Martin, that people in the media are going to say mean things about them. Why can't they get over that? They're always going to say mean things about them. Yeah, they're always going to say mean things about them. And what I have learned is that when the left is saying mean things about us, whether it's the media, the elected officials, or activists, they're usually just projecting what they actually are. So you just have to get over what they're gonna say about you and do what is right. Right is right and wrong is wrong, and you have to be able to stand up for what is right. And we need our elected officials doing that right now. And beyond the elected officials in Congress standing up and doing what they can and their power, and they have the ability, they have different they have more power and a different ability to stand up against us than we do as an individual citizen. But as individual citizens, we also need to be working to secure elections and to win elections in 2024. Because if the elected officials won't take action, the only way to stop this is to send a message to all of them that we, the voters, we, the people, do not consent to what's going on. And we have to do that through secure elections that we win. The fact that Joe Biden, through his Attorney General Merrick Garland, has now thrown these criminal charges at his primary political opponent, it, it actually makes us lose standing internationally when we try to scold a country like El Salvador or, or, or Venezuela for, for politically utilizing their justice and judiciary system against a, a political opponent. I mean, the, 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 I keep using the word degradation, you do too, because that really is what we're witnessing here. Uh, does, it, does it make you think that maybe a new Tea Party movement might be brewing here because the people are so frustrated and it's time to take to the streets and have those rallies and have those demonstrations? Or do you think because we've got a political uh, uh, election coming up, presidential election, and Donald Trump, the target of all of this, is one of the candidates that uh, that's who, they're going to rally around a candidate rather than just rallying around the idea? I think that what's going to happen is that they will rally around the candidate. Once the debates begin, which is going to be in just a few weeks, the presidential election sucks all the oxygen out of the, the media. So the, the presidential candidates get the attention of the media and we can have rallies or protests. They won't get a lot of earned media attention. I think the best thing that we can do, and I'm not saying we shouldn't maybe go have sign waving events and have rallies and stand up, for, for Trump, but he can do that through his own, own campaign as well. The best thing we can do is get involved and make sure that we win these elections. Yeah. And one thing my organization is working on is modernizing how we get out the vote for 2024 um, just for that very reason so we can win. That's good to know. Uh, one thing that I think it's, it's heartening to hear from all the candidates is that they have to start doing the early voting, doing the get out the vote, being robust in that. And, uh, and not allowing the last uh, the shenanigans that have happened in the last couple of elections to occur. Are all the candidates on board with that message? And by the way, is the RNC on board with that? I mean, they've got a lot of money, they've got a lot of resources, they've got people on the ground. Why does it even take a group like Tea Party Patriots to have to do this when you would think this would be the RNC's job? Well, it should be the RNC's job. Um, I, I 
I can't speak for what, what they're doing exactly. What I can tell you is that last election cycle, they did help with getting poll watchers in place around the country. I believe that the RNC placed 80,000 poll watchers nationwide, and we helped recruit and, and get people trained. But at the end of the day, in most seats, it's going to be the political party who has to place the, the poll watchers in some capacity, whether it's through the party or through candidates. So they have to be engaged with that, and they were. There's still more work to be done, though, and mm -hmm. it's more than any single organization can do. Lawsuits can happen. Um, challenging voters, what their eligibility to vote where they, they are registered to vote. A lot of things can happen that the RNC may not be able to do single-handedly. By the way, it's important to point out, you, you make the case in your article at Town Hall that uh, this Merrick Garland weaponization of the Justice Department, it didn't begin with these criminal indictments against Donald Trump. I mean, uh, during the Glenn Youngkin election in Virginia, when the parents' movement was getting so much attention and, and making such a difference in that election, suddenly, Here's Merrick Garland saying that parents are domestic terrorists and we got to get the FBI to investigate them. When Roe v. Wade was on the brink of being overturned, we had protesters threatening violence outside Supreme Court justices' homes, and Merrick Garland did nothing to enforce the law against such behavior. And then once Roe v. Wade was overturned, we had uh, uh, people arrested for praying in front of Planned Parenthood clinics. And meanwhile, there have been no arrests in the vandalization of pro-life pregnancy centers. I mean, one thing after another, this is the most politicized Justice Department I can remember. It, it absolutely is. And um, it, it, it is clear that Merrick Garland has an ax to grind in addition to Joe Biden, and they are doing all they can to cleave to power and not to allow our representative democracy to work as it should. They're interfering with elections. They did it in 2016 and they did it in 2020. And I don't necessarily mean Merrick Garland and Biden did it at that time, but the FBI and the Justice Department did in both of the other elections as well. And when Barack Obama in 2011, 2010, when he sicked the IRS on groups like yours during the Tea Party movement in the lead up to his reelection, campaign. He got away with it. Uh, you know, mistakes were made, apologies were made after the election, after the, the job was completed. Do you think that was sort of the trial balloon? They saw they got away with it then, so now they're in charge again. They're just going to keep doing it. Yes, I absolutely think that's what happened. And I went to the Justice Department after President Trump was elected and spoke with then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, trying to get accountability for the people who actually did the um, illegal activity towards us. And he didn't even, uh, Jeff Sessions did not understand what had happened to our group, to Tea Party Patriots, nor to most of the other groups around the country. And it was clear to me that the Justice Department was not serious about researching and investigating it. They never once even reached out to the groups who were the victims to ask what happened to us. How can you have justice without talking to the victim? Yeah, this is why people take to the streets and do those Tea Party rallies and marches <laughs> and such. Just 30 seconds left, and one other coincidence. Uh, when those excesses happened under Obama, you remember the White House said, oh, the first we learned about this was on TV. Exact same thing the Biden White House is saying about these events. Yeah, it, it's the same thing all over again. They got away with it with us, and they upped the ante in 2016 throughout Trump's entire presidency, and they're upping the ante again. We have to stand against this. All of our elected officials should work to impeach him, at least in the House of Representatives, and we have to do all we can to secure and win elections. Jenny Beth Martin, keep fighting. You've been doing it the whole time I've known you, over 10 years now at Tea Party Patriots. There's more to come on O'Connor tonight. Keep it here. You're watching Salem News Channel. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was in China yesterday and he made this announcement in the wee hours of our morning. Take a look. On Taiwan, I reiterated the long-standing U.S. One China policy. Uh, that policy has not changed. It's guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, the six assurances. We do not support Taiwan independence. We remain opposed to any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side. We continue to expect the peaceful resolution of cross-strait differences. 
I find it funny that he led with, we don't support Taiwan independence. Maybe he saved that for the end, or maybe just leave it out. One China policy usually is sufficient to convey the message, but he wanted to make sure that his hosts there in China knew, we don't, we don't want any independence for those people. <laughs> Last thing we want. What a mess. Joining us right now, president of Project Sentinel and also a uh, retired U.S. Army lieutenant colonel in the intelligence arena. He is Tony Schaefer. Tony, why? Why, why do we have Hello. to like kowtow like this and say, uh, you know, last thing we want is for the independent free people of Taiwan to be independent and free? Peace for our time, <laughs> Chamberlain uh, said in 1938. And uh, I've been spending the entire morning uh, reviewing everything since this came out. Uh, this is 1938, uh, Chamberlain, and uh, if, if I were the people of Taiwan, I'd be studying what happened to the country of Czechoslovakia that next year. Hmm. I'm just telling you, uh, I, I do a lot of time. Uh, history does not necessarily repeat itself, but it takes examples from the past and puts them into the present. Uh, this was a terrible meeting. And I know it's terrible because CNN is trying to put a really good face on it, so it's, it's got to be bad. Uh, yeah. Apparently, every every issue brought up was dismissed by the Chinese. It so. was previewed last week by our friend Gordon Chang, who pointed out, and you're not seeing this from CNN either, is that the person who met our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, wasn't even his counterpart. It was some low-level, mid-level bureaucrat. Right. I mean, the, the insults just continued throughout the entire visit. Well, they held off to the very last minute, even keeping it a mystery if he was going to meet with Xi himself, the premier, and he finally did. But... From everything I've seen, and again, it's going to take me a day to kind of sort through everything, it was very like, uh, you will listen to what we're telling you, and this whole idea of repairing uh, the relationship. Larry, there's no repairing it. The Chinese are getting everything they want. <laughs> Blinken is a dupe. I mean, uh, listen very carefully to the language they used. I, I've listened to one NPR interview this morning, and again, I, I like listening to the left kind of... Uh, you know, basically kind of make excuses on how, oh, it's OK that they are not coming halfway to meet us on Ty Taiwan. Oh, it's OK that they're not listening to what we consider our interests. It's all good. We're trying to repair things. No, it's all uh, giving uh, platitudes and placating the Chinese. And, and this is not this is not bode well for as I as I intoned. Uh, we look, it looks a lot like Czechoslovakia, 1938. Yeah, you mentioned Neville Chamberlain waving that piece of paper, peace in our time. Well, look at this headline. Oh, yeah. Blinken says China promised not to send arms to Russia. Well, that, that should be. They promised, Tony. They promised. They promised. <laughs> yeah. Look, the Chinese have no interest in keeping any word to the United States, especially since we are seen as weak. Uh, they're going to lie, cheat, steal. Uh, again, you refer to our friend Gordon Chang. Gordon, according to Gordon's information, which I've seen from my sources, the Chinese are already providing material support to the Russians, perhaps not in sending them big old crates of 105 millimeter uh, howitzer rounds, but they're already doing other things. It is not in the Chinese interest, Larry, to see Russia lose. As a matter of fact, they want Russia to win. That's why they're they're taking such a hands-off approach. And at this point, other nations do too. Uh, Pakistan, India are all dealing with, with Russia because we are seen as weak. And the more things like this happen with Blinken deferring to China, just reinforces the perception of those former allies that we are a power in decline and we are not to be taken seriously. You worked in military intelligence, uh, specifically the Defense Intelligence Agency. A day or two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Trained by the CIA. Uh, one of your former colleagues, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, was a guest of ours last week, and I talked to him about this. With yeah. regard to China and Ukraine, for that matter, Russia, various adversaries, all having information about either the president or, by extension, the president's son. There's no right. doubt that this presidency is compromised because of his son, because of those con the contents on that laptop. Even if there's no evidence of direct dealing, which I believe there, there is evidence of that, just China knowing everything there is to know about his son puts him in a compromised position, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't you love to have that kind it of does. information on one of our adversaries? One of our three-letter agencies, uh, Larry, asked me for a pristine copy of the Hunter Biden hard drive for the very issue you just asked for. And uh, they knew that their leadership uh, maybe may have been an agency relating to Mike Flynn or maybe not. But I'm just saying people had the same concerns you and I have about patterns, about compromise. And yet every, every element of the federal government eventually turned it away, didn't want to see it. 
So uh, I do believe that it's there's ample evidence that Hunter Biden was the bag man for Joe. And they took money from the Chinese. That's why you see Blinken bending over. Look, Blinken was the guy managing the Chinese donations to the, the Penn Biden Center uh, that yeah. uh, that came through the University of Pennsylvania. Right. So uh, then you then you see Hunter getting money from Burisma. Uh, so to me, it's it, there's ample evidence that the, the president is compromised from multiple directions, and that's and again, I think the Chinese know that, and that's why they're acting out the way they are. Um, you think about the three major policy objectives outside of our borders by the Biden administration. It's been trying to acquiesce or make nice with China. It's been uh, first allowing Russia to sell oil and gas to Europe in the uh, Nord Stream right. pipeline, which, which the Trump administration opposed. That opened the door for their aggression to right. Ukraine. And now we're dumping money right. into Ukraine hand over fist. All three of those countries have direct financial dealings, it appears, with the Biden family. I, I mean, what, forget about smoke, that's a raging inferno. Right. And all things being equal, if this was a Republican administration, uh, they would have been articles of impeachment day one when those documents showing the direct link between President Biden, Hunter Biden, and those foreign adverse, foreign countries paying him off. It would have been it would have been long done. Instead, we're going through this slow, like painful reveal kind of you know left wing cope, trying to explain away everything. The man is compromised, Larry. Yeah. The president is compromised mentally because of age and and uh, uh, de decrepitness, and he's compromised morally because he's taken the bribes and he's acting in ways that would not naturally be done under a president who has the United States interests and our policies as his so primary. We have a focus. presidential election coming up in a year, mm -hmm. and we had two major reports last week of uh, government systems and major corporation systems being compromised via cyber attacks. Right. Uh, it, it, do we have any confidence that the systems that uh, run the basic institutions and infrastructure of our country are being protected and, and stay safe as we enter an election year, a very important election year? Well, well, they're being protected, but badly. And I think this is one of those things that I think you and I could recognize uh, just from the layman's perspective. I have some inside information about kind of some of that. And it looked to me from my sources, Larry, that this was a reconnaissance, re uh, military term reconnaissance and force. This was basically trying to go out and ascertain by a foreign power. I have my theories of who it was, but I don't want to get into it at this minute until I have more evidence. This was basically an attempt by a foreign power to examine how hard it would be to push through those firewalls, Larry, on call. They, this is a, mm. trying to assess what, what would be most vulnerable. And again, this is linked to Cuba. Cuba, as you saw, the Lourdes listening post, the Sign Signals Intelligence post has been reactivated. This, these are serious things going on that, that would happen uh, uh, by a nation that's about to conduct aggressive actions against a, yeah, a so, superpower. Yeah, and that, I that, would not be holding back. That Cuba uh, outfit, by the way, first denied by Admiral Kirby speaking on behalf of the NSC, and then two days later said, well, yeah, it's there. And of course we lied to you. You bet your ass we lied at you. That's, that's the Biden administration. Thank you, Tony. More to come on O'Connor tonight. Mm -hmm. Last week, former President Trump, as you know, was indicted on 37 counts for having classified documents, apparently, in some cardboard boxes that he took from the White House, um, like any other president has done in the past. Uh, meanwhile, it was revealed that President Joe Biden, when he was vice president, engaged in multiple phone calls with a foreign interest that uh, essentially bribed he and his son to the tune of $10 million in exchange for a foreign policy decision under the Obama presidency, and apparently those phone calls involving the bribe might be on tape. So what did the media focus on? Well, they focused over 300 minutes on the Trump story and that much time on the Biden story, at least the major networks. One question was asked of the president at a press conference by a New York Post reporter. Here's how that went. Why did you ask such a dumb question? And apparently the rest of the mainstream media thinks it's dumb too because, I mean, they have no curiosity about this scandal either. Well, our next guest, David Marcus, he actually thinks this is the only story that we should be focusing on. And David, I think you're right. I mean, listen, last I checked, a president taking a bribe from a foreign country should be a pretty big deal. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and to answer Joe Biden's question about, you know, why would we ask that question? We ask that question because the, the term the big guy is all over this scandal, right? So the, the, the fact that we see it here again, every every bit of this scandal is like a laser cut jigsaw puzzle piece, right? And, and what is the media doing? You mentioned 300 minutes on Trump, zero minutes on this case. This is the Hunter Biden laptop playbook all over again. First, they say, we don't believe it. Not only do we not believe it, but we think it might be Russian disinformation. So it would be irresponsible for us to even mention it. Yeah. Then two years later, oh, you know what? Maybe it actually was his laptop. In fact, it was, but it's really not much of a big deal. They're trying to play this again, but it's not going to work this time because Republicans control the House of Representatives. So do you think that it's reached another point where it could very well be impeachable? I mean, I, you've got the crime of the bribery. You've got obstruction of justice because the Justice Department and the FBI have been ignoring it for, what, five, six years. And now you've got the cover up because Christopher Wray sent that document, but he redacted the information about the recordings. I mean, that, that looks like a cover up to me. It's all the hallmarks of an impeachable scandal. I mean, it, it certainly is. And, and I mean, by the, by the standards of Donald Trump's impeachment, I, I mean, any state, like, wasn't that all we ever heard, right, during the Trump impeachments? Well, you can be impeached for anything. It's right. whatever Congress says it is, right? Yeah, I mean, th there's obviously so much smoke here. I think we probably don't need impeachment right at this moment because we have these investigations that are ongoing. And it seems like once a week, um, Representative James Comer is coming out with new damning information about tens of millions of dollars that are going not just to Hunter, not just to Joe Biden's brother, but last month we learned nine members of the Biden family to do what? Yeah. And David, I got to ask you, uh, you, know, you mentioned the impeachments of Donald Trump. The first impeachment of Donald Trump had to do with his phone call with President Zelensky of Ukraine, specifically about investigating Biden and bribes and Burisma. The FBI was sitting on this information the whole time. This is exculpatory what they knew about what they were impeaching Trump about. Yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely amazing and, and something that I think every American needs to think about, that the FBI was absolutely sitting on a document that showed that Donald Trump was not guilty of what he was being impeached for. Because everyone said at the time that if there was a legitimate national security interest for asking for that investigation, then there was no impeachable offense here. And we absolutely know that's true now. Now, listen, it wasn't the FBI that was impeaching Trump, but I'd like to ask Representative Dan Goldman, who at the time was the guy impeaching Trump and, and, and was the, the attorney for the Democrats, did he know about this? Right. Did he ask? Yeah. David, we only got a minute left. You know journalists. You work with them. Uh, you hang out with them sometimes, even have a cigarette with them. Um, at some point, their competitive nature kicks into high gear, right? At some point, a one or two might start to stray and say, wait a minute, there is a story here and I'm going to go after it. Maybe. I, I, I'm not confident in this case. I think in this case, uh, the, most of the mainstream media will not even acknowledge it until there's no way not to, right? Again, it's the Hunter laptop yeah. playbook. At, at a certain point, you just can't lie anymore. But you, you've, you know, you've played this long game and you've distracted people for long enough that when the bombshell drops, it doesn't feel like a bombshell. Yeah. David Marcus, we'll keep watching it, but we'll keep reading what you're doing. Great stuff. As always, your byline is electric. Thanks, David. Thank you. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place. In the meantime, I will see you on the radio.